this uh, conference has a long history. Um, it's been uh, in the Northeast, which is why it's named uh, the New England Undergraduate and Graduate Conference and Research. So you can see we've had a nice trajectory um, of an uh, increase of posters and faculty presence and students. Um, over the last couple years, I've been keeping count of all the different institutions that have arrived. Um, so every year it's a little bit different. So if you don't see yourself on this list, please shoot me an email and I'll be sure to add you. Um, but we have had a really nice representation of um, universities uh, throughout New England. Um, and occasionally, this is from last year, we've even had um, people come from quite a distance to present their research. So this is our geographic attendance. So we're pretty much clustered in New England. We often have um, some people coming from uh, outside of New England. So with that, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Dr. John Salamone. Switch to this. Um, so Dr. Salamone is um, the Board of Trustees Distinguished Professor at University of Connecticut, where he directs a research program underlying the neurological basis and mechanisms that underlie um, effort-related functions of dopamine and other neuromodulators. Um, specifically, his lab studies animal models of depression, motivation, effort-related decision-making, and drug-induced Parkinsonism. Dr. Salamone received his bachelor's degree as a major in psychology and a minor in biology from Rockhurst University. He did his um, PhD at Emory University in psychobiology. He uh, did his postdoctoral training with an NSF grant at um, University, I'm sorry, Cambridge University in England. And then he spent uh, a couple years in England in industry working at Merck and other pharmaceutical companies. Um, so he stayed there, and then upon his return, he joined the University of Pittsburgh Department of Behavioral Neuroscience, and then ultimately he landed at University of Connecticut. Um, so his um, main models, his research in particular, uses uh, multiple methodological approaches, including in vivo electrophysiology and behavioral ph pharmacology. He focuses on dopaminergic functioning. Um, his... Uh, one of the main models that I think he'll talk to you today will be about effort, choice, and motivation. Um, so his research has been funded, and I'm getting a little choked up because he's my former advisor, which I'll tell you in just a moment, so that's why I'm a little, I don't usually have a problem introducing anyone. <laughs> so he's been funded by NIMH, um, uh, and, uh, NIDA, and uh, uh, Neurological Disease and Stroke. He is actively engaged. He's a prolific writer. He is a editor for many journals. He's been cited thousands of times. He um, is really, where I'm getting a little emotional, he is a, uh, an amazing mentor. So he has had 75 undergraduate students. He's had 20 PhD students. I was number 11. Uh, <laughs> I have a t-shirt that says number 11. <laughs> so I've had the profound honor of being mentored by him, and some of the words I wanted to say is that he was like a strict parent, um, but he really couldn't hide his compassion and concern for you. So it was very easy to go the extra mile for him all the time. Um, he also encouraged us to think outside of the box, and I think that he will set the stage for, for you for that today. So for example, for many years, people assumed that dopamine in the nucleus accumbens was simply a reward-related pathway, and he allowed us to think um, in a much more complicated way. So he basically has told the scientific world that there are distinct aspects of motivation related to dopamine, and that the dopamine in the accumbens is really important for um, work and effort and choice, and that is what he's going to tell you today. And so finally, I think his greatest accomplishment is his daughter, um, Isabella Salamone. And so this is how I remember her on the left in, in the lab. Um, she was wearing lab coats, and she was actively involved. And she is currently um, a graduate student at Northwestern. So please welcome, take, join me in welcoming my old mentor, Dr. John Salamone. Thank you, Adrian, for a uh, really kind uh, introduction. I might be a little choked up, too. Who knows? Um, she was an awesome graduate student. 
and uh, I'm very proud of you. And thank you. Thank you for organizing. Group hug. <laughs> so I'm really excited to be here, uh, everybody. This is a great, a great event that you've put together. Uh, I was trying to think of a slogan. Uh, neurons of the world unite, and maybe I left out. You have nothing to lose but your brains. So uh, with that in mind, let's move into uh, a very brief uh, acknowledgement. I'll acknowledge more people later as well. Some of the people who have worked on this project, some of the grant funding that I've received for this. And let me point out a few graduate students that are here that have worked and some of the things that I'm presenting include Jen Hao Yang, Renee Rotolo, Rose Presby. They were in the picture that Adrian showed. We have a collaborator that uh, Adrian has worked with, that we've all worked with, we've continued to work with, uh, Merced Correa, who is in a lab in Spain right now. It's not raining and not cold where she lives in Spain right now. And so we've kind of, we've, she sent students to us. We've had students go back and forth. We've had um, a lot of collaboration, and she's an integral part of this story. So speaking of stories, I just wanted to set the backdrop for this by saying that um, how many times have you ever heard somebody talk about a scientific lecture? And they say, you know, that was a really good story. Uh, and, I, and, and in fact, something I want to mention is that humans understand things through stories. I mean, if you think back 10,000 years ago, when there was no internet, there were not books, there was not even cuneiform, how did people understand things? Stories. Stories make things memorable. But stories oversimplify things, and sometimes stories become so changed over time that they essentially become myths. So if the subtext of, of this talk is dopamine, depression and antidepressants, I just want to mention th three things that I call oversimplifications that maybe even border on mythology. So number one, uh, Adrian mentioned before that dopamine it, it has sometimes been labeled as the reward transmitter, a pleasure chemical. You'll see that on the internet. It's even been in movies. Lo love, is it a chemical? That kind of thing, all right? Uh, another uh, interesting thing that I discovered as I started reading more about depression, another thing that's really an oversimplification is depression is really about a lack of pleasure, and that's pretty much it, uh, sometimes called anhedonia or a mood dysfunction. Depression is much more complicated than that, and we'll talk about that. And then a related idea that depression is this unit unitary entity. It's sort of, there's this box. It's called depression. And then when you give a drug that we label an antidepressant drug, that it generally works in a uniform way against that. And so uh, what I've done is interwoven uh, uh, some of these myths into the talk that I'll present. So number one, dopamine is, has been labeled as a pleasure chemical, as the reward transmitter, mediating hedonic reactivity. All right, and usually the system, the dopamine system that people talk about when they, when they mention this is called the mesolimbic dopamine system. The, cells, the, uh, the cell bodies, the point of origin is in ventral tegmental area in the midbrain, and it projects to sometimes called ventral striatum, nucleus accumbens being the biggest part of that. Okay, and I want to point out too, sometimes, uh, you know, rat people, we need to emphasize that the human brain has, of course, all of these structures, and it has these uh, systems, including the mesolimbic dopamine system. So first of all, is it the reward transmitter? It's a bit more complicated than that. So even though you will certainly see in textbooks that a pleasurable stimuli, increased release of dopamine, what else would you see if you really dug into the literature? That aversive or stressful uh, conditions, uh, foot shock, tail shock, tail pinch, anxiogenic drugs, uh, social defeat stress, when one animal, you know, basically beats up another animal in an aggression paradigm, conditioned aversive stimuli, all of those things also increase uh, extracellular uh, dopamine or dopamine neuron activity. So, I mean, if, uh, I think maybe Marquis de Sade would find all these things pleasurable, but for most of us, uh, they're not. And here's just two examples. I don't want to go into details, but this is showing with foot shock an increase in ventral tegmental dopamine neuron activity. And here, this is a neurochemical measure of uh, voltammetry showing an increase in extracellular dopamine in response to tail pinch. All right, what's another problem? Uh, Berridge and Robinson, huge group at University of Michigan. They've published tons of studies 
where they have a model of hedonic reactivity in rats that involves facial reactivity, which any human researchers know is also widely used in human research on emotions. And they found out that if you give drugs that block dopamine or you deplete dopamine, that you don't actually block the hedonic reactivity to food. And this was one of these things that sort of took the neuroscience uh, community by storm, but now has become uh, uh, an established phenomenon. Also, you might think, well, what about drugs of abuse? Those are all, it's in every textbook that the pleasure from all drugs of abuse is mediated by dopamine, except for these naughty little papers here that show that dopamine antagonism <laughs> doesn't actually blunt the euphoria produced by various drugs of abuse. Most of these are stimulants. This one's actually nicotine in a smoking study. Then finally, one of the simplifications that's embedded into this is that if you just make this general statement, you say uh, dopamine is a reward transmitter in this very, very general sense. It doesn't take into account that there are important distinctions to be made among different aspects of motivation. Now anybody, oh, you're all students of neuroscience, behavioral neuroscience, you know, in the learning and memory literature, this is standard. There's no one thing that you call memory. There are very different memory circuits that, that handle very different types of information. Well, the same thing is true of motivation. So one of the things that you probably have learned in a class, for example, if you're a student, or you might remember from classes if you're a faculty member, is motivated behavior takes place in phases. So you have what's called an instrumental phase, sometimes called the appetitive phase, uh, sometimes called sinking, uh, seeking. Uh, and then when an organism directly, directly interacts with a motivational stimulus, you have another phase, a consumatory phase, consumption or taking. And this idea, it's about 100 years old. Craig, 1918. If you're ever playing Trivial Pursuits, the neuroscience version, this could be <laughs> one of the questions. All right. Another thing to consider about motivation is that motiva motivated behavior has what's called activational aspects and also directional aspects. So directional aspects. Motivated behavior is directed towards or away from stimuli. We were all directed here, correct? But you also have these activational aspects, the vigor, the persistence, the work output. You know, I had to get up. I had to drive uh, quite a ways. I had to do all sorts of things this morning in order to get here. And these activational aspects of motivation are important. They're what enable us to overcome obstacles or overcome work-related constraints. You know, what if I got up and there was some problem? I, would, I wanted to come here, so I would do whatever was necessary <clears throat> to get here. It's a really a, a critical adaptive aspect of motivation that we overcome obstacles. All right. Now, in addition to that, <clears throat> we make motivational decisions. And a lot of motivational decision making is based on a cost-benefit analysis. What kinds of things are available to you? Which do you prefer more? Which do you prefer less? But there's a cost that involves. And there are lots of different costs. Could be time, could be some aversive component, all sorts of things. But what I emphasize is what's called effort-related decisions. And that's an aspect of the general uh, motivational decision making. The idea that organisms are constantly weighing the value of a reinforcer, the preference for a particular reinforcer, versus what they have to do in order to get it. In other words, the work-related response cost and the exertion of effort that's involved. Now, <clears throat> other researchers study cognitive effort a lot. So there's a guy, Stan Floresco. He works with Catherine Winstanley. They're at the University of British Columbia in Canada. They have emphasized a lot cognitive effort. But what I tend to emphasize, emphasize and what we'll talk about today is more in the realm of physical effort. <clears throat> so we've developed procedures that basically involve effort-related decision making. What does that mean? Animals are given a choice between obtaining a reinforcer that's relatively preferred, but they have to work hard for it, versus what we refer to as the low effort, low reward option. <clears throat> And what's the effect of dopaminergic manipulations on that? I'm summarizing uh, almost 30 years of work here by talking about this. So I'll be very brief. Dopamine antagonism, so drugs that block dopamine receptors, and dopamine depletions, and particularly nucleus accumbens dopamine depletions, they shift the choice behavior, right, away from the high effort option towards the low effort option. All right, and we mostly use food 
reinforcement and food motivation, although we've started using other things as well. Uh, but to use food as an example, if you interfere with nucleus accumbens dopamine, you deplete dopamine, you locally inject a dopamine antagonist there, the animals remain directed towards the acquisition and consumption of food. And if the food is available, they will eat it. And their preferences will be intact. But if given this effort-related choice, they tend to select the low effort option. In other words, they have what we call a low effort bias. So here's one of the procedures I'll talk about today. Uh, <clears throat> the animals have an option of lever pressing on a fixed ratio five schedule. So five presses gives one pellet of a preferred high carbohydrate uh, food pellet from BioServe uh, versus just eating the regular old bog standard lab chow. Um, I've eaten both and like the rats, I strongly prefer these pellets. I would work for them if I was given that choice. So the rat is kind of in a Shakespearean dilemma, to press or not to press? That is the question. Well, if it's an FR5 schedule under control conditions, they tend to lever press and get most of their food from lever pressing. But <clears throat> we've shown time and time again, interfering with dopamine transmission shifts their choice behavior away from lever pressing and towards the consumption of the chow. Now, everybody that does behavioral work you know that for every one experiment you do that shows something, there's five more experiments you have to do just to interpret the first experiment. And that's what this is a summary of, again, about 30 years worth of work. So the effects of dopamine depletion and dopamine antagonism, they don't resemble the effects of reinforcer devaluation by pre-feeding. Uh, you pre-feed an, an animal instead of running it food restricted, you've devalued food as a reinforcer. Those effects are very different, all right? The effects of interfering with dopamine don't resemble the effects of appetite suppressant drugs, and we've tested a number of them, all right? Uh, they're not due to effects on appetite, food consumption, food preference, hedonic reactivity to sucrose, mentioning the Barrage type experiment, discrimination of reward magnitude, the delay or the intermittence of the reinforcement, or even reference memory. And one of the summary statements I might, might like to make about this pattern of results is what we've done is if you interfere with accumbens dopamine one way or another, you effectively dissociate preference from the tendency to overcome effort costs. In other words, the preference remains intact. If it's free access, the animals still choose the, the tasty pellets over uh, the chow, and they eat normal amounts of it, all right? Um, this idea of preference versus choice, I can have, give you a very easy example, right? And, and it emphasizes why I use this term cost. Imagine I said, okay, I have a brand new Mercedes, and I have a beat up old Volkswagen. Which do, one do you want? Which one do you prefer? Does anybody have any doubt which one you would pick if I gave you that choice? You know, the fender's falling off the Volkswagen and it's got two, it, you know, it's, it, it doesn't even register how many miles it has on it anymore or whatever. <laughs> That's your preference. But then I give you the price tag, and the Volkswagen is worth $1,000, and the Mercedes is worth $40,000. And what would a lot of you say? I prefer that one, but I can't afford it. I can't pay the cost. And that concept is used in behavioral economics. And in the case of rats, rats don't use money to buy food. They don't use currency. They use barter. They exchange their la labor directly for the reinforcing stimuli. So what we've done here is we've dissociated the preference, which one they'd rather have, and well, how much work are they willing to do to get it? In other words, paying the effort costs. So this slide <coughs> is meant to remind me, to remind you that is dopamine the center of the universe, this one brain area, the center of all this? And of course not. Uh, dopamine in nucleus accumbens is only a part of the larger circuit involving lots of different brain areas, lots of different transmitters, and several investigators other than our lab have begun to look at this uh, as well. Now that's oversimplification number one. What about number two? Depression is mainly about a lack of pleasure. Okay, that's complicated. And I'm not even going to include things like there's all sorts of cognitive problems in depressed people and all sorts of executive function and decision-making problems. What about 
these aspects of motivation that we've been talking about. Turns out dysfunctions and behavioral activation, uh, they're common symptoms of not only depression but other disorders. They're given names like fatigue, psychomotor retardation, apathy, anergia, lassitude, amotivation. Fundamental aspects of depression, though you see them in Parkinson's patients, schizophrenics, people with traumatic brain uh, injury, and multiple sclerosis as well. So what, is, what are some of the details? All right, Depressed people, what are the kinds of things that they show? They show psychomotor symptoms that resemble Parkinsonism. So these papers compared literally the motor slowing and other psychomotor dysfunctions in depressed people with some of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And they simply pointed out, you know, there's a lot of similarity. All right, Reduced locomotor activity. This one grabbed me. You can put like a Fitbit on people, an actimeter, and measure their locomotor activity as they go around the house. Depressed people show lower levels on average of, of uh, motor activity. And a recovery of motor activity is actually related to a general recovery of depressive symptoms. All right? There was this interesting factor analysis paper done several years ago that kind of got buried in the clinical literature. They, they, they looked at a bunch of uh, scores on a, diff, a whole bunch of psych, uh, psychological tests. The energy fatigue impairments, that was a factor highly correlated with the overall symptom severity of depression, all right? And then it's also true, briefly I'll mention in Parkinson's disease and schizophrenia, you have motivational symptoms as well. It's typically called fatigue or apathy in Parkinson's patients. Uh, this guy Friedman here points out that Parkinsonian patients say things like, my battery ran down, my engine has been turned off, things like that to describe uh, what they're experiencing. And then sch schizophrenics have what are called negative symptoms. Positive symptoms are hallucinations, delusions, but schizophrenics also show uh, a motivation which is grouped under negative symptoms. So uh, we developed tests of effort-related decision-making years ago, and then clinicians discovered them. This guy, Tread, Michael Treadway, came to my lab when he was a grad student, worked there for six months. He's developed human effort-related decision-making tasks and applied them to this uh, experimental psychopathology. And he was the first to report that depressed people, on average, also show a low effort bias when tested on his uh, task. It doesn't involve food, so there's no bioserve pellets there. It involves money. Do you work hard to get more money, or do you work less hard on a trial, but you get less money? And that's been followed up by other researchers as well. And then you also see this kind of effect in schizophrenic patients, uh, particularly with negative symptoms. And also, more recently, it's been demonstrated in Parkinson's disease patients. So this is something that is widespread in psychopathology. I focus on depression because that's where it's probably most obvious, but it's present in other disorders as well. And then what about the brain mechanisms? Turns out there have been several imaging studies, a post-mortem studies. What are the brain areas involved? The same brain areas that were in my diagram that I showed you just a few minutes ago. Cut it, cutamen, nucleus accumbens, all dopamine rich areas, and then cortical areas, prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate cortex. So there seems to be some parallels between what's been shown in humans and what we've been able to show and others have shown in rats. And then finally this, and this will be the bulk of my talk. Related to what we were just saying, is depression this unitary entity, antidepressant drugs then uniformly treated? I was at a meeting a few years ago. I was the only basic scientist there. It was uh, almost all clinicians. There was even one person who argued there's no such thing as depression. There's this collection of, of different symptoms. We tend to lump together. We tend to emphasize some and de-emphasize others, and we label it as depression. So I might view that as an extreme view, but nevertheless, that's an arguable uh, view. What's inarguable is that there are many components of depression and that antidepressant drugs don't necessarily have the same effects equally on all of them. So for example, let's take the SSRIs, things like um, Prozac, uh, Lexapro. Those are, as a group, the most commonly used antidepressants of all. All right? And they're sometimes just labeled antidepressants. And some of the studies on these drugs, they don't even break down the types of symptoms that are affected. But the studies that do show an interesting thing, which is SSRIs are pretty good at treating things like mood disorder, anxiety, 
rumination, which a lot of depressed people have, but they're actually relatively poor at treating these motivational, these activation-related motivational dysfunctions. Okay? And in some people, SSRIs can actually make these symptoms worse. And when I read that, I kind of found it hard to believe. The most commonly prescribed group of drugs can, in some people, make the most debilitating symptoms worse. Okay? But you only get that when you really dig into the literature. There's a small number of researchers who are clinical researchers who've identified this and have made this a big point. All right. Now, there are also a few reports of some dopaminergic drugs that actually can improve motivational dysfunction. And when I started reading all of this stuff, I realized our work is potentially related to this, that there's a need in the field to develop animal models of effort-related dysfunction that basically have some formal connection to the psychopathology, and especially I've tended to emphasize mostly depression. So a part of our strategy is this. We take rats. We uh, basically expose them to manipulations, which in people show depressive symptoms, including anergia, fatigue, things like that. So what are the kinds of things that we look at? We look at antagonists of dopamine D2 uh, receptors. They're used as antipsychotics. They don't improve negative symptoms in schizophrenics. And when tested in normal controls, they actually induce negative symptoms. Okay? Uh, genetically altered mice. Uh, right now, we have a big study going on. Jen Howe uh, uh, is working on that. One of my students, Rose Presby, is working on that. Um, tetrabenazine, I'll talk a lot about that. It's a dopamine-depleting agent, and Adrian mentioned that before. And then a little bit about pro-inflammatory cytokines. This is another thing that's kind of opened my eyes about a different area of research that I really wasn't aware of until a couple of years ago. All right, so let's focus on tetrabenazine. So what is it? It's a drug, it's commonly used to treat Huntington's disease, um, but its major side effects include depressive symptoms, including uh, anergia, fatigue, et cetera. What is it in terms of its mechanism of action? It's an antagonist of the, a protein VMAT2, the vesicular monoamine transporter type 2, which is important for storing dopamine in vesicles. So if tetrabenazine blocks VMAT2, dopamine is less likely to get, be stored in vesicles, and it's broken down. So this results in a depletion of dopamine. Now, it turns out, at high enough doses, it would affect any, this drug would affect any monoamines. But it's relatively selective for what are called catecholamines, dopamine and norepinephrine. And in fact, at the very lowest doses, it has a selective effect on uh, striatal dopamine, meaning dopamine in the cardioputamine and nucleus accumbens as well. All right. So we started working on tetrabenazine a few years ago, developing it into a model. And what makes it a model, reminding you, is that in humans, this drug can produce depressive symptoms. So we have a kind of a parallel. So one of the things that was shown years ago, Eric Nunes, who's now at Yale. Anybody from Yale here? You probably know Eric. He's a very distinctive creature. He showed that uh, everybody who knows him is giggling right now, like he has. Um, tetrabenazine reduces. Uh, postsynaptic signaling at D1 and D2 family receptors as measured by this protein, uh, a phosphorylated DARP32. Now, you're just going to have to believe me. It would take too long to explain today that these beautiful pictures that Eric took uh, are basically are markers of this reduction in the postsynaptic signaling in, in terms of dopamine receptors that results from tetrabenazine. We also have looked at extracellular dopamine, and I'll show you a figure on that. How do we do it? We use this method, microdialysis. So you insert a probe into the brain. You pump an artificial cerebrospinal fluid through. You, uh, uh, at the very tip of the probe, as the artificial CSF is passing through, the, pr the, the probe is porous. It's dialysis fiber, like that seen in kidney, kidney dialysis machines. And small molecules pass through. They're collected then and can be analyzed. In our case, we analyze it with high-performance liquid chromatography. And there's an actual chromatogram showing um, dopamine. OK, so what does tetrabenazine do compared to an injection of vehicle? That's the control condition. It substantially reduces extracellular dopamine, about a 75% um, reduction. And this is actually a very low dose. This dose has been shown not to have any effect on uh, serotonin. 
All right, so what are the effort-related effects of tetrabenazine? A couple of things. It increases sensitivity to operant lever pressing requirements, meaning what's called the ratio requirement. We published that recently. A way of saying as is that it affects elasticity of demand. And again, this is something that Jen Hao, one of my students, has worked on. Uh, a low effort bias in rats is produced on all the procedures that we use, a concurrent progressive ratio, a TMAs barrier choice. I'll mention these in a few minutes. But I want to start talking about the concurrent fixed ratio 5 chow feeding choice procedure because that's the one that we've done most of our work on, and that's the one I mentioned before. So here's the procedure again, uh, I don't, I just to remind you. Uh, and now, what does tetrabenazine do? Tetrabenazine produces a dose-related decrease in lever pressing. That's the work component where they have to press for the preferred pellet. And they, their motivation shifts in the sense that they're still are directed towards food. They're less inclined to work for the food, but there's that dish of chow just sitting there, a dramatic increase in um, chow intake. All right, and this is something we do a lot in our lab. Renee just had an experiment a few days ago and she said, it's amazing how much these tetrabenazine animals eat. Um, <laughs> you know, so they're still hungry. They're still directed towards food, all right? All right, this is an effect, an effect that's related to nucleus accumbens. Why? The triangle is the nucleus accumbens. This is a coronal section of rat brain. And injection of tetrabenazine there decreases lever pressing and increases chow intake. But if you have a control site, the caudate putamen, which is also called neostriatum, dorsal to that, that's the square, you don't get the same effect. So it's a site-specific effect related to the accumbens. Now, important controls, yet again. Uh, the effects of tetrabenazine don't resemble the effects of reinforcer devaluation. They don't resemble the effects of appetite suppressant drugs. And importantly, tetrabenazine doesn't change the intake of or the preference for the preferred food. And that's what's shown here. So across a wide dose range, no effect on intake. These are free feeding choice tests, a separate experiment. Dish of the preferred pellets, dish of the yucky lab chow. The preference does not change. The consumption doesn't change, all right? Also, interestingly, if you did this with sucrose, this was done by our Spanish collaborators, Pardo et al, 2015. No change in sucrose preference, no change in sucrose hedonic reactivity using that procedure from Berridge and colleagues. So behaviorally, it's a relatively specific effect, and specific enough to say, well, what if we started to look at drugs for their ability to reverse that effect? Why are we doing that? As Adrian said, uh, you know, years ago, I worked at Merck. A part of my research has always been drug development, all right? And so what we're doing is we've been looking for the last couple of years at the ability of drugs, some of which are well-known antidepressants, some of which have another profile, to reverse this tetrabenazine related effects. And what we focus on here are ones that block various aspects of monoamine transport. So dopamine transport is DAT. That, that, that thing over there is DAT. <laughs> CERT, you are certain that this is a serotonin uptake a blockade. This is what SSRIs do. NET, nothing but NET, right? Norepinephrine transporter there. And we've looked at drugs from across these different profiles. And what do we see? Well, we've looked a lot at dopamine uptake blockers, and here's a list of some. This is your uh, tetrabenazine showing VMAT. But there's the dopamine transporter. And remember, if you give a drug that blocks dopamine transport, what does it do? It makes more dopamine available in the extracellular space. The transporter is a means of inactivation. So if you block inactivation, you have more dopamine. So lots of drugs that block DAT block or reverse the effort-related effects of tetrabenazine. So a lot of these reversal slides, they look the same. So let me take you through the first one in detail. So what is bupropion? Bupropion, also known as Wellbutrin, it's a catecholamine uptake blocker, so it blocks dopamine as well as norepinephrine transport. Um, it's commonly used, though not as much as the SSRIs. But one, some of the clinical reports say Bupropion is actually a little better at treating motivational dysfunction than the SSRIs are, and that's why we started there. So here, what does tetrabenazine do? 
it decreases lever pressing, and it increases chow intake. And in these conditions here, you have co-administration of tetrabenazine with different doses of bupropion. And what does bupropion do? It largely reverses, but significantly reverses, the effect on lever pressing and the effect on chow intake. In other words, it, te it tends towards restoring the normal pattern of behavior if bupropion is uh, co-administered with tetrabenazine. All right, so this is a clinically used drug. GBR12909, an experimental drug, much more selective for dopamine transport, does the same thing. That co-administration of GBR12909 increases lever pressing and decreases chow intake in tetrabenazine-treated animals. So you have substantial, though partial, reversals of the effects of tetrabenazine. And one thing about drug research, the more drugs you use with different patterns, the more you can form a clearer opinion. So here are a few more drugs. Methylphenidate, also known as Ritalin, used to treat um, ADHD. It's also been used to treat motivational dysfunction in people. There was a German study uh, years ago saying that motivational symptoms are improved with methylphenidate in depressed people. Methylphenidate, like the drugs I showed you before, reverses the effects of tetrabenazine. And then modafinil. What is modafinil? It's a wakefulness agent, but it does block dopamine transport. That's one of its effects, all right? And this drug uh, also reverses the effects of tetrabenazine, as shown there. So what about these other mechanisms of action? Dizipramine is an example of a drug that inhibits norepinephrine transport. Fluoxetine is a drug that inhibits serotonin transport. It's a, an SSRI, also known as Prozac. What does it do? It does not reverse the effects of tetrabenazine, right? So that's shown here. And if anything, it tends to make animals slightly worse. That's consistent with some of the things you can pull out of the human clinical. Uh, literature. And I should mention we actually have a couple of posters from some of my undergrads related to this. I don't want to preempt them, but I just wanted to point you in that direction. Here's another SSRI. Again, sometimes you need a confirmation. Citalopram is the generic name for Lexapro, very, very well-known drug. Does not, over a broad dose range, reverse the effects of tetrabenazine. Okay? And then what about the norepinephrine transport inhibitor? <clears throat> Dizipramine also does not reverse the effects of tetrabenazine, and at the highest dose actually makes the animals worse, less inclined to lever press. So an interim summary just for this chunk of information. Um, we see that there's a pattern there, all right? All antidepressants are not equal, all right? Uh, Drugs that increase dopamine transmission, and here we've just talked about DAT inhibitors, drugs that block dopamine transport, they actually can reverse the effects of tetrabenazine, whereas drugs that block norepinephrine and, and uh, serotonin transmission selectively don't have that same effect. Now, we've looked at other classes of drugs, and I should say, this was this drugs we're going to talk about now are a class of drugs we started working on when Adrian Betts was a grad student in my lab uh, and actually was kind of a pioneer for this line of research. So in addition to loving dopamine, I love dopamine. Dopamine's been very, very good to me, you know, <laughs> through the years. But I've developed this liking for uh, adenosine. Why? What's the deal here? Well, adenosine is a really important uh, neuromodulator. It's a, it's a molecule that's used for all sorts of things all over the body. But in the brain, it's an important neuromodulator, and to a certain extent in the periphery. The A1 and A2A subtypes of receptors are the major adenosine receptors in the brain. And we all just took an adenosine antagonist, and we should be feeling one of these two things mm -hmm. right now. So caffeine, but also related compounds, theophylline and theobromine, which are other methoxanthines. You get them in coffee, you get them in tea, you also get them in energy drinks. What are they? They're, they act as minor stimulants, and they're non-selective adenosine receptor antagonists. But what about this A2A receptor, all right? Turns out, wherever there's an intense concentration of dopamine, so in these striata areas, caudate putamen, nucleus accumbens, there's a very rich concentration of adenosine A2A receptors. That's true of the rat. That's also true 
in humans. And again, this was something uh, uh, Adrian will remember, uh, Ginger Vontel, who actually did this study in our lab uh, and got access to human tissue. So what's the big deal about the A2A receptor? Not only is it in dopamine terminal areas, but it also, uh, it basically interacts with dopamine receptors. In particular, the A2A subtype of adenosine receptor is co-localized on exactly the same neurons that tend to concentrate dopamine D2 family receptors. And they interact with each other, these receptors, so drugs that act on these receptors interact with each other. So adenosine A2A receptors and dopamine D2 receptors, they're co-localized. They converge onto the signal transduction pathways that involve cyclic AMP and protein kinase A, all right? And they also can form heteromeric complexes, meaning they, they can actually link to each other and affect each other's actions. Now, there's been a lot of drug development on adenosine A2A receptors, a lot for uh, Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonian models. And this was the work that Adrienne actually worked on in my lab and got her dissertation in this area. One of those drugs, estradiophylline, is approved in Japan now. It takes a long time to get drugs through the pipeline for treating Parkinson's disease. But remember, Parkinson's patients can also get fatigue and anergia, and so two papers, one a case report, the other a more complete study, show that fatigue symptoms, that's how it's usually labeled in Parkinson's patients, fatigue symptoms can be improved with an adenosine A2A antagonist. So we're very interested in looking at those, and we have for several years. So this is a study um, with the FR5 choice procedure, again, tetrabenazine, decreases lever pressing, increases chow intake. We got this drug here, an experimental adenosine A2A antagonist, uh, MSX3 from Krista Mueller. If you, if there, are there any uh, medicinal chemists here? They name their chemicals after themselves. They're like children. So these are all M. <laughs> they're M because she's Mueller, right? And I used to work with a guy, Abraham Fisher, and all his drugs are AF something or other. So I understand it's their baby. Well, it turns out to be a pretty successful baby. Why? Because co-administration of the adenosine A2A antagonist, MSX3, like we saw with the drugs that act on dopamine, uh, reverse the effects of tetrabenazine, increasing lever pressing and decreasing chow intake when co-administered with tetrabenazine. All right? And then we've done some studies with another procedure, the um, TMA's choice procedure, and we've looked at adenosine antagonists and other drugs too. So with this procedure, the starting point is kind of a, a TMA's where you have more pellets here in rats, four pellets here, two pellets there. And gas, of course, rats prefer that. But what about this situation where you have a vertical barrier in rats, a 44 centimeter barrier that they have to climb over in order to get the high concentration of food pellets here, or they could just wimp out and go over there, right? So some rats will hear, you know, that dun, 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 the, the Olympic theme, right? They'll hear it. They know the Olympic motto in Latin. Our rats speak Latin, sidious, altius, fortius, right? Faster, higher, stronger. And then some are like, why bother? Because you can, you can treat them with a drug that shifts their choice. So tetrabenazine shifts the choice, all right? And uh, basically, what have we shown? Dopamine antagonism, nucleus accumbens, dopamine depletions, shifts animals towards the low effort option. Now, when the barrier has four pellets and the other arm has no pellets, so the only way to get food is to climb the barrier, they climb the barrier. So it's not impossible for them to climb the barrier. It's just they'll choose not to do it if they have another way to get a smaller amount of food. And what about when both arms have a barrier? Their choice is unaffected. So again, they can climb the barrier, and their preference for the high density of reinforcement stays the same. So this is a recently published paper from our laboratory. Sam Yon was the first author with the teammates. And we have a bunch of different controls here, as shown. So the no barrier. The, the, the dark uh, histograms here, the, the dark bars, no effect. There's no barrier. They still prefer four over two. Four zero barrier means the only way to get food is to climb the barrier. There's nothing in the other arm, no significant effect. That's the gray bar. But when there's four pellets in one arm and two in another, you give them another option for getting some food, but they don't have to exert effort, that's where you see the significant effect of tetrabenazine. 
And this is important too because with the other procedure, we, we were comparing a, an essentially an instrumental behavior versus a, approach and a simple consumption, right? Here we have two, in the TMAs, two explicit instrumental behaviors and we're still affecting the choice. Now, bupropion, that uh, uh, antidepressant I mentioned before that blocks dopamine transport, that reverses the effect of tetrabenazine. So tetrabenazine decreases selection of the higher barrier arm. Co-administration of tetrabenazine restores the normal pattern of behavior. And so does MSX3, that adenosine A2A antagonist uh, from Krista Mueller. So here's a summary of all the drug reversal studies with these procedures. Do not worry. You don't have to memorize all of these drugs. Actually, though, I realize I have students in my drugs and behavior in my neuropsychopharmacology class. Sorry, you do have to memorize <laughs> all these drugs, OK? But the take-home story is that the drugs that reverse the effects of tetrabenazine either facilitate dopamine transmission or they are adenosine A2A antagonists. We recently completed a study with prilatinant. Um, we have an undergrad who worked on that, Sarah Frigno, and uh, Renee, Jen Howe, Rose, all worked on that project, all right? And these are, of course, the drugs I mentioned before that don't have that reversal effect. Now, I want to talk a little bit, just for a couple of minutes, about inflammation. How did we get from the brain to inflammation? Well, a lot of the people who study the nervous system, and Adrian's included in this, know that there's this crosstalk between peripheral inflammation and central nervous system function. Um, cytokines are examples of pro-inflammatory uh, compounds. Uh, in humans and in other animals, they've been shown for a long time to reduce motivation, for example, reduce social interaction. Um, when do we tend to get a big uh, um, uh, increase in cytokines? Everybody here has experienced this, so I think you can identify with it. Do you know that so when you get an infectious disease, one of the things that happens is an increase in cytokines? Well, when, think about it. When you get a cold, you're sitting there at work, and you're trying to work hard, and you start to feel like, you know, I just want to go home. I just, I just kind of want to like lay on the couch and turn on the TV and maybe fall asleep and cover myself with a blanket. Uh, it's a natural response to infectious disease. And it turns out to be cytokine mediated, all right? And it's not depression in a, strictly, in a strict sense, but it is related to these motivational dysfunctions seen in depressed people. So that's, if you can capture what that feels like at that moment, you're not sniffly yet, but you know that, oh, I just don't feel right. I feel like I have no energy. That's essentially that core component. What's the value of that? What's the adaptive value? People have debated that. Um, one thing is, interestingly, if you uh, do that, you can serve resources. You can serve energy, and it helps your body fight off the disease. The other thing, I read this really interesting uh, article, a theoretical article in the epidemiology literature, and they say, if you, when you get an infectious disease, if you have a reduced tendency for social interaction, you're less likely to spread the disease, and that could be a part of the evolutionary basis of that. So it's fascinating. A bunch of other cytokines we have data on, interferon alpha, it's used to treat cancer in multiple sclerosis patients. Look at this, induces depressive symptoms, and if you break it down by symptoms, 80% show fatigue and lassitude, by far the most common side effects of cytokine use in humans. Uh, many depressed people have elevated levels of cytokines. Um, cytokine levels can actually be related to the therapeutic response in depressed people, all right? And um, uh, recent studies show things like inflammatory markers are correlated with psychomotor speed in depression. And IL-6, that's one of the cytokines, uh, basically levels of that particular cytokine are associated with Parkinson's disease fatigue. So I started to get interested in this a lot, and just a few years ago, we started to look at two of these um, cytokines. One, interleukin beta, uh, Nunez et al., 2014, and then another one that I'll actually present, interleukin 6, uh, Jan et al., 2016, and also that my lab actually does have um, a poster uh, related to uh, actually a negative effect in mice. The rats show a much a stronger response in terms of IL-6, and that's what I'll present, but you should check out that poster. So IL-6, when administered, very potent. That's not a mistake. I didn't, like, you know, have a tremor when I was doing that. That's not milligrams per kilogram. That's micrograms per kilogram. Very, very potent. 
IL-6 decreases lever pressing, increases chow intake. In that same dose range, no effect on food consumption or food preference, and no induction of fever. So it's not like the animal is just becoming so sick that it has a high fever so it doesn't do anything. That's an important control. Turns out, if we do that microdialysis procedure, uh, IL-6 significantly reduces extracellular dopamine in nucleus accumbens at the same dose. That's the behaviorally active uh, dose. And then a drug that does block dopamine transport, methylphenidate, Ritalin, also significantly but partially re uh, reverses the effects of IL-6. So there's IL-6 decreases lever pressing, increases chow intake. Methylphenidate restores uh, to a certain extent, the normal pattern of behavior. So peripheral inflammation is important. And then finally, I'm right on target. Uh, the last procedure I want to briefly mention is something called the progressive ratio choice procedure. So what if you made lever pressing really hard? With the progressive ratio, they start out pressing maybe one press, and then you have to do two presses, and then three, and then so on and so on and so on. You have a gradually incrementing work requirement in order to get the preferred food. All right? So the animal faces a choice. If it was Arnold Schwarzenegger, it would say like, do I, do I press the lever or do I wimp out, right? <laughs> and of course, what they do, they all do it. At some point, they wimp out. It's just too hard. It's just too much to do. They stop lever pressing. They switch to chow and take. And this procedure is interesting for two reasons. Number one, the chow intake is relatively high, so you can see more easily if there's an appetite suppressant effect going on. And number two, because they stop pressing, it's an easy procedure to see a drug which on its own increases selection of the high effort option. And so this is a summary of that without any data. Uh, the drugs that increase selection of the prog so they actually stay in there longer, they press higher include drugs that block uh, dopamine transport, for example, adenosine A2A antagonist. And more recently, we just showed this, this paper just came out. Uh, Deprinil is an MAOB type inhibitor. That's monoamine oxidase B. It's used as an anti-Parkinsonian drug, though it can have antidepressant actions. These drugs all increase. What decreases it? The same drugs that don't reverse the tetrabenazine effect that I mentioned before, SSRIs, uh, uh, Dizipramine, and then a, a, a newer, more selective norepinephrine uptake inhibitor, atomoxetine. Interestingly, that's used to treat ADHD, but it doesn't have behavioral stimulant type effects. It doesn't work uh, in this procedure. All right, so some conclusions. I have three slides of conclusions, and then I just I want to acknowledge a lot of the people that worked on them. So there seems to be this important dopaminergic uh, control over effort-related choice, all right? And this may be related to aspects of depression, and there are human studies that are consistent with this, all right? So first of all, dopamine transmission exerts a bi-directional control over the high effort activity. If we reduce dopamine transmission, you have a low effort bias. But as we just saw with the progressive ratio, if you enhance dopamine transmission, you increase selection of the high effort option. All right? Blockade of dopamine transport reverses the effects of tetrabenazine, but in contrast, drugs that block the serotonin transport and norepinephrine transport, they don't. So we really distinguish among the different monoamine uptake blockers. All right? What about human studies? So several drugs that block dopamine uptake, including bupropion, methylphenidate, and modafinil, have been reported in the literature to have some positive effects on motivational symptoms. I should mention, too, modafinil uh, is that wakefulness agent. We currently are collaborating with a medicinal chemist in Austria, Gert Lubeck, and we have one poster related to that, an analog of modafinil that also works uh, in our procedures. All right? And then, interestingly, in normal human volunteers, this was work uh, Michael Treadway is one of the authors on this. Amphetamine, uh, a drug that increases dopamine transmission, increases selection of the high effort option. So that's an, uh, the opposite of what depressed patients show. And then modafinil increases task motivation. Really interesting study from a group at Cambridge. They gave this wakefulness agent. That's what it's prescribed for. But it does all sorts of other things. And it does block that. 
And they, so they, when, if you just give modafinil to people and say, rate your mood, eh, they don't report much of a mood effect, unlike a drug like amphetamine or cocaine, where they do. But well, here's what's interesting. If you have them perform a task, in this case, they were all cognitive tasks, they report that they like the task better, and they perform the task better. So th the way they summarize it is it increases task-specific motivation. And then your perception of the task changes. And how many times have we done that? There's something that if you didn't have that cup of coffee, for example, most of us don't snort lines of modafinil, right? <laughs> you have something to do. Um, you basically, oh, I, can't, I can't face this. I'm hating this. I have this report to do. So you know what? I'm going to have a coffee. And all of a sudden, like, this isn't as bad as I thought it was, OK? So modafinil produces that kind of effect in people. Very interesting. And then finally, we need to look at other things, drugs that act on adenosine. Glycine is an important neuromodulator. Inflammation, we've just scratched the surface on that, all right? Now, in terms of these models, what I want to get across is, you know, we, we do link it to depression, especially the tetrabenazine. We link to depression because of the literature on that. But these motivational symptoms, they're seen in people who are depressed, Parkinsonian, schizophrenic. And I want to link it to something that the NIH has tried to do in the last few years. Who here has heard of RDOC, Research Domain Criteria? Really important thing in mental health. The idea behind RDOC is get beyond traditional diagnostic categories. Get beyond depression. Get beyond schizophrenia. Don't think of them as boxes that are separate from each other. Rather, think about specific symptoms and the neural circuits that mediate them. And if you think about it in that way, some psychopathologies actually share some neural pathologies and probably share symptoms as well. So our work is consistent with RDOC. I was actually on the original um, RDOC uh, study group uh, that went down to Washington to develop this. And I think it's a really great approach, especially for research. And I think the idea is basically you can disentangle, deconstruct psychiatric disorders, but then eventually put them t back together with a framework that's more based on neuroscience. That's the long range goal. All right, so to acknowledge all of these people, I've had zillions of people work on this project. The Correa Lab has had lots of people. There's Merce Correa there. There's Eric. I told you he was an interesting creature, sticking himself in the front. And then here are my students, all of whom who are here. Jen Hao Yang, Renee Ritola, uh, Rose Presby. You'll see them roaming around. Last but not least, the awesome labs, uh, uh, undergrads of the Salomon group. Here they are. We brought an army down, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> Thank you very much.